So yeah, quite a few busy days in markets. Uh, we're now seeing a bit of a better mood in markets. Uh, we're seeing, uh, well, we got this Credit Suisse steal. UBS bought them up for half the price they traded on, on on Friday, and that was already a low price. And we also got that liquidity provision from the Fed and five other or six other central banks. So quite a quite massive support for markets. We saw markets cheer in Asia. Then uh, there was some. Um, uh, weakness and now it's cheer once again but it's quite a roller coaster what's going on there yeah we'll begin very shortly um, this webinar is about stuff that is at the moment unrelated to the banking crisis I mean it's things I've prepared for you but of course <laughs> there's no way I can uh, uh, spend time with you guys talking about markets without talking about uh, this uh, banking crisis so yeah thanks uh, for coming i hope everybody's trading with care um, when we have these violent things in markets we have crazy crazy stuff uh, technical levels are not respected and things that seem overbought or oversold they can last uh irrational for a longer time than we think so just um just take that into account yeah and yeah, we'll begin uh, uh, very shortly. Again, thanks for coming on this busy day for markets. Well, it's not the only busy day. We had two very crazy weeks. Uh, yeah, the word crazy might be overused, but I don't think there's there's a better word for what's going on right now. And uh, yeah, so uh, lots of action uh, going on. And um, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks again for coming. Waiting for the sign to to kick it off officially, but uh, we'll uh, we'll begin very shortly. Talk about two double-edged swords, uh, but again, we can't avoid uh, the banking crisis unfolding before our eyes. It's, it's major. So yeah, uh, so I guess we can. Uh, I guess we can kick it off, right? Yeah. Uh, so, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for uh, coming today. We're going to talk about the two major economies in the world, two double-edged swords. My name is uh, Yochai Lam. Um, I'll do a well, very quick presentation about myself for those who do not know me. I used to be a retail trader, a computer programmer. I founded my website, Forex Crunch, back in 2008, joined FX Street in 2018. I'm leading uh, FX REITs premium product. Now my focus is on, fu on fundamental analysis. That's what we'll talk about today. Fundamental analysis is becoming more relevant when we have crazy moves in markets and uh, technical lines are not respected as they used to be. Okay, so just before we kick it off, here, well, here is Jerome Powell, the chair of the Fed. He'll make a decision on, on Monday and Xi Jinping, the chairman of everything, <laughs> uh, Chinese Communist Party president, uh, yeah a very big impact there but be, before we start i'll do a very quick pitch uh, telling you about our premium product uh, which which i lead you can tap into 20 years of our experience we have lots of insights about forex and we also discuss stocks cryptos commodities lots of questions about gold these days um you can access our instant trade notifications and alerts we have uh, detailed trade plans and well you can ask us anything i think that's a uh, key part of uh, of the product. You can just ask us questions in our Discord community, and um, you can get uh, these trading alerts with entry uh, signals, and we get lots of positive feedback. If you don't believe, well, if, <laughs> this is internal feedback that we got, uh, but you can also go to Trustpilot and see what people are saying about us. So yeah, uh, really lots of lots of advantages. I think if you're trading seriously and if you want to up your game in trading, then you can join us here. I'll share the link in the chat so you can uh, sign up now or after this webinar. And um, yeah, and you can ask me and my colleagues and uh, great uh, questions. We recently added uh, Ian Coleman to the t uh, team and we recently had a, a winning streak of, I think, nine out of ten trades uh, went well so really things are uh, going well and you're welcome uh, to to join us 
Okay, so uh, that, that's my pitch. You can sign up now or later. Let's talk about what you came here for. So, I'll talk about the current state of markets, uh, what's next for the Fed, what's next for China, currency directions, and uh, then I'll make a ranking of all the currencies where I see them moving, and then we'll have a bit of time for questions. So, we are here. Uh, so far, I'll put the banking crisis aside just for one second. There is no landing. The US economy is doing really well. Growth continues at full speed. The consumer remains healthy. People are buying, 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 and buying. Uh, more people coming into the workforce. So we had uh, the participation rate growing. And yeah, expansion continues. We talked about a soft landing, a hard landing, and now no landing at all. That's also a possibility. That looks good. Now let's put the banking crisis here. If the banking crisis causes financial conditions to tighten very much. What does it mean? So we have the collapse of the of Silicon Valley Bank uh, and then Signature. Not very big banks, but no money is flowing from the smaller banks to the bigger ones. Uh, less competition, which means uh, banks uh, um, can offer uh, worse conditions to clients. That means less money for the global for the economy, the U.S. economy, and the global one, and also. Um, it means that um, uh, people are in general more afraid of taking any kind of risks and therefore uh, they can, uh, well, uh, save more money or, or just not spend. So that's a risk that we're seeing in the past uh, two weeks. I believe uh, it will subside. I believe the Fed will raise rates this week. But at the moment, it's something we should uh, be aware of. If things worsen from here, if another bank collapses or there is a need for more bailouts, or if there are massive layoffs, I don't see them coming yet. We'll talk about that uh, very shortly. Then uh, the banking crisis, um, yeah, that's one. Well, that's part of the double-edged sword. So it, it, everything comes together uh, to the Fed. So let's, um, yeah, let's. This is America in China, it's the world's second-largest economy. COVID restrictions begin uh, belonging to the past. We're not talking about that anymore. Geopolitical worries are dismissed. Uh, everything is about again banking and about uh, how, how fast will China grow? Uh, and remember, China uh, China s saved the global economy back in 2009 by stimulating it, by throwing lots of money after we had the housing and financial crisis of 2008. So currently, there's still optimism, again, with this caveat of the banking crisis, which is very temporary. And even Europe, I'm not going to talk any more about Europe because focus is elsewhere, but winter is almost over. Actually, tomorrow is the last day of, of winter and spring begins, officially. Uh, Germany hits a bump in the road, but is generally doing well. No recession just yet in the Eurozone. They avoided it. And uh, so far, I think Europe is sort of neutral to the global economy. That's why we're going to talk about other, uh, the two other uh, major economies, the U.S. And, and, uh, and China. So let's move to the U.S. So, until February 1st, the Fed told us that it's going to raise rates towards 525 and stay there throughout 2023. Um, and they were optimistic that inflation is falling. Uh, they talked about tapering down the process of rate hikes. No pivot. And markets saw a peak in May and cuts later on. So, it's sort of the end of the Fed um, tightening cycle. Okay, so... Since then, we got lots of positive data. We got uh, non-farm payrolls last month, 517,000, I think that's for January, and recently 311,000. So really strong figures for the economy. Then we had uh, inflation also rising, 0 0.4 on core CPI, the most important figure in the inflation report, core CPI month over month. And then last month, I mean, just a recent report, 0 0.5. So inflation is high, jobs are strong. Even the core PCE, which is a lagging indicator, it jumped, and usually it's more moderate, okay? So the U.S. economy is on fire. But I think some of the figures are a bit uh, screwed to the upside. Inflation baskets are updated once a year. Rate expectations, I expect them to retrace. What did we have so far? We had retracement of uh, rate hike expectations, not because of the U.S. economy, but because of the banking crisis. So in the past uh, week or so, we went from Fed Chair Powell talking, hinting about a 50 basis point hike to having this banking crisis unfold. And uh, some even talk about the Fed cutting interest rates. At least what we see in bond markets is at the moment a 50-50 chance of either a rate hike of 25 basis points, the most modest uh, rate hike possible, 
or zero, okay? So um, we could see a slowing down of the US economy due to all these factors. And the optimistic view is that we still get more people coming into the workforce, we get lower wage growth, we began seeing seeing that uh, last uh, uh, in the report for February, and um, that means inflation at some point begins declining because people are making less money. And the Fed raises rates now, raises rates uh, in May, 25 basis points, and that's it. And they stop raising rates. It's good news, news for stocks, bad news for the U.S. dollar. But in general, the U, the global economy, the U.S. economy, they begin, uh, they slow down, but they continue growing. So we're all good, right? Now let's take the pessimistic view, and this can be uh, exacerbated by the uh, crisis with Credit Suisse, uh, Silicon Valley a Bank, a Signature, and who knows which worry will come up. Well, we have this uh, First Republic Bank, small banks we've never heard uh, uh, before, uh, so these things uh, could uh, could become much worse. So we, we got we could get instead of just a slowdown in job growth and, and wage growth, we could get a reversal. We could get losses. We could get too many people fired. Not only programmers in Silicon Valley, related or unrelated to Silicon Valley Bank, but uh, job losses. Uh, in this case, the Fed the Fed still pauses in May, but it's due to the to bad news to a uh, stalling of the economy. In that case, it's bad news for stocks and good news for the U.S. dollar because the U.S. dollar is a safe haven. So the Fed could have the same policy of raising rates by 50 basis points more. But if they do it because inflation is falling, it's good. If they, if it's, uh, if they do it because uh, the jobless rate is rising, because people are unemployed, that's really bad news, okay? So it means different outcomes also for stocks and the U.S. dollar. Okay, what we should uh, uh, look out for? Uh, any, uh, I mean, these two figures are the most important ones, jobs and inflation. Let's move on to, to China. We're getting, we're getting some chills from China. So China is the world's number two economy, engine of global growth, as I mentioned in 2009. But all this growth potential is, is, is falling apart. Population is shrinking in China, okay, the world's uh, largest uh, country in terms of population, but, but they're shrinking, like they're not making any, I mean, they're, they don't have uh, their growth rate in terms of uh, natural growth rate, birth rate is, is slowing down. And the potential for growth, not only net, uh, growth in uh, number of uh, habitants, habitants, but also in terms of, in economic terms, the mass urbanization, what triggered this growth was people moving from the villages to the cities and this is over and they're not anymore uh, a very weak economy that just needs to build a factory and and growth is much stronger they're uh, already a high-tech economy with in artificial intelligence and uh, everything now they are unleashing growth last year we had a very bad year for china we had the draconian covid restrictions and if you wanted to travel to China, you had to wait something like three weeks, two weeks in, um, or in an official, well, uh, mini prison, let's call it, uh, locked in a hotel room, and then uh, at home, uh, that's over. Uh, but uh, they cracked down on tech uh, companies. Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba and Ant, basically disappeared from public view, and they cracked down on uh, property developers, on, on construction. Evergrande is the biggest name, but there are a few others. So COVID is over. That's that's done. The people are moving around. Uh, but on the other hand, China wants to surpass the U.S. but still wants control. They they don't want these free Maya spirited entrepreneurs in the tech sector to thrive that much. Property crackdown today. We learned that Evergrande reached a settlement with uh, its uh, debtors, but uh, they still uh, maintain some of the restrictions. Okay, so they still want control. Um, and what matters is not uh, perhaps the exact growth rate, but what type of growth rate. So this is again the double-edged sword. The old model for China was build, 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 lots of investment being the factory of the world, investment and exports, and also construction, building um, homes for people in cities. Uh, this is very com commodity intensive. It means higher global growth, and it's positive uh, for the US dollar because it lifts inflation, okay? Um, the new model 
uh, is the positive point here is that they're moving towards tech. Uh, so shift from manufacturing to services, lots more internal consumption still means pressures on prices outside China, okay, because Chinese uh, people are going to consume uh, stuff from outside. But uh, it's not that strong for global growth. It's a bit negative for the US dollar. It doesn't mean that much inflation. It's not inflation that comes through uh, commodities, okay? So that's the positive p uh, pivot from, from China. If we have more uh, internal consumption of services and less manufacturing, that's good for the global economy, good for stocks, bad for the US dollar. If we have the old model of building stuff, uh, creating stuff, uh, manufacturing, that, uh, that's negative for the global economy. Okay, so yeah, so these are the two double-edged swords. I mean, you can have a US slowdown, which is good for the uh, US and global economy, bad for the US dollar, and you can have the, the bad kind, the same, the same with, with China. Okay, um, yeah, I'll continue to, yeah, maybe the part you've been waiting for, just give us what you think will happen with each currency, how you rank them. Yeah, so here we are. So uh, talk about each currency, how I see things going on, and then I'll make a list, okay? So let's begin with the world's number one currency, uh, the dollar, uh, the US dollar. Uh, I expect it to go downhill from mid-March. We're, we're beginning to see that. We're in mid-March now. Um, a bit after mid-March, but I still see more downhill from here. We need to see softer data. We've seen mixed data so far. Uh, it should be weak enough for markets to begin pricing in rate cuts uh, towards the end of the year. We're getting that thanks to the banking crisis. Uh, hopefully, it's uh, not only for uh, uh, the banking crisis, but it shouldn't be too bad to attract uh, safe haven flows. Um, and for me, the trigger is a 5% unemployment rate in, in the United States. Uh, while the unemployment rate stays under 5%, it's all good. If people are working in, in the U.S. and inflation falls and the Fed loosens policy, that's good news. If, but if the unemployment rate rises above 5%, which here in Spain is half the current rate, and we're in a very good situation, but in the U.S., if it reaches 5%, that means many people are unemployed. Uh, because of differences in the system, that's that's bad news. Okay, so uh, just to, for those of you who are not aware, the US, the smile theory, when the US economy is very strong, the Fed needs to raise rates to slow down the economy. Okay, and in that case, uh, we will see, we'll see uh, uh, the US dollar rising. When the US dollar is, well, sorry, when the US economy is in a terrible situation, the U.S. Uh, suffers, the rest of the world suffers even more. The U.S. sneezes, the world catches a cold. In that case, the U.S. dollar also rises. Sweet spot, the smile, the bottom of the smile, the bottom of the mouth for the U.S. Uh, dollar is when you have sort of moderate growth and then uh, the Fed doesn't need to raise rates and money looks goes outside the U.S. to look for more risky bets. Okay, that's the uh, dollar smile theory things we're talking about also in the premium section um, almost every day. Okay, so that's US dollar. Uh, again, my uh, point to watch is jobless rate under uh, 5%. Uh, that's that's a key figure. Uh, Europe here, uh, winter is almost over. I expect some spring strength because everything comes too late to Europe. So if we have issues with banks in the US, Issues with banks in Europe are probably worse, but they come later. We've seen that right now. Uh, so we can we saw the European Central Bank raise, raising rates by 50 basis points just uh, five days ago. And I expect um, further uh, rate hikes. We're seeing very strong core CPI. In fact, core inflation in the Eurozone is higher than in the US. The ongoing terrible war, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, is in the background for European policymakers, for markets, uh, and we're still seeing extreme uh, labor shortages. So I think your, the euro is relatively strong. Well, we're seeing it today, so it's easy for me to say today. But uh, I think this will uh, this will continue some euro strength. Um, in uh, the UK, the Bank of England went too far with its gloomy forecasts. The deal between the EU and the UK around Northern Ireland is a big deal. It's a big boost. It improves uh, relations. The economy is holding up. 
the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, stated that it sees no technical recession. That's also good news. And eventually, the Bank of England, despite this gloomy picture of uh, Andrew Bailey, the governor, I expect further rate hikes as soon as, as this week, as Thursday. So I think the pond is also relatively uh, better positioned. Um, Bank of Japan, this is Haruhiku Kuroda. He already made his life decision. He has a few more days in the job. Um, Ueda, Kazuo Ueda, his successor, uh, talked about continuity, not making any changes. But eventually, he'll be forced to change because the Bank of Japan just cannot buy that much debt. There is not enough debt. So they'll have to, uh, they have a policy called yield curve control of holding debt, uh, sorry, holding 10-year Japanese yield capped at 0 0.5. Eventually, they'll have to let it go. Uh, these changes might wait for May. So far, spring wage negotiations look really bullish. So we're seeing, uh, we're seeing this, um, um, I think, uh, with higher wages in Japan, we'll see the Japanese yen also hold up relatively well. Australian dollar. Uh, Australian dollar is uh, recovering today, but uh, outside, uh, zooming out, let's talk about Australia. Still depends on China. Uh, we had a few months of optimism. I think we'll have a few more months of optimism about Chinese growth. But then again, this is a double-edged sword of China. They're not willing to let go of control of their economy. I think eventually China will be found out. To mm, They won't provide the, the growth they promise. And, and yeah, the Australian dollar expected to lose ground, expect the housing sector also to, to suffer a bit. And this could cause, uh, uh, yeah, some weakness in the Australian dollar. So far, Australian dollar it has this uh, relatively strong correlation with US stocks. It's weakening just a bit. Uh, I think once uh, we, get, uh, we get some trouble from China, we could see the Australian dollar suffering even if US stocks rise. All right, uh, the Canadian dollar. I, don't, I know many of you don't like the Canadian dollar. I think it's a nice currency to trade. But in any case, the Bank of Canada already paused raising rates. Um, that means weakness. Oil hopes, uh, hopes that oil will rush to 100 or whatever Goldman Sachs says. That is not happening. We're seeing now even oil breaking below 70. Uh, the level that uh, uh, reportedly uh, U.S. government is buying uh, barrels. And I expect uh, interest rates to Bank of Canada to begin cutting interest rates before uh, everybody else. We're seeing a pain in the U.S. Uh, and sorry, in the Canadian housing sector. And yeah, so this is a sum up. I told you I'll uh, provide a ranking. These are, of course, my bets, my expectations, not... Uh, not a, tr a trading advice. So I expect the next few weeks to see the euro strengthening, uh, number one, the pound running right behind it, the franc also going up. I think the deal between shotgun wedding, you can call it, of UBS uh, um, swallowing Credit Suisse, uh, that's uh, also good news for the franc. And uh, then the Aussie, I think sort of mixed, uh, mixed trading, a bit of strength now, but weakness later on. Then the Japanese yen, followed by the Canadian dollar towards the end, and the U.S. dollar at the bottom. Uh, U.S. dollar got lots of safe haven flows. I think it'll be unwound. I think uh, everybody's here to uh, to uh, stabilize the system and prevent a 2008 scenario. Regulators are in a much, much better uh, position than they used to be. Okay, this is my ranking. Uh, yeah, you're welcome to ask uh, questions. I might have been speaking very, very rapidly, so any, any clarifications, all questions are welcome, like in our premium section. That's an opportunity to remind you that you're welcome to join our service, uh, where uh, I think it's a, it's a good deal. You can tap into our 20 years of uh, trading experience. Of course, you get discounts if you sign up for uh, longer term, deep discounts, I would say. Um, you can leverage your actionable content, learn the best practices from, from ourselves. Uh, you have trade plans to follow, and we have a really, really nice community. Uh, not only people asking us questions, but uh, uh, between uh, you know, traders, uh, we ha have a good, uh, good vibes there. So um, we're getting lots of positive feedback. Again, check us out on Trustpilot. 
and yeah so um yeah let me share that link again while we wait for questions yeah while we wait for questions um I'll uh, maybe add a few more words about uh, we have the Fed decision tomorrow. So if you're seeing the recording of this presentation before the Fed, um, I expect the Fed to raise rates by 25 basis points uh, to do what they said they would do because inflation is still strong, core CPI is rising, um, and um, the employment situation looks very strong. So they still need to fight inflation. And another thing, if they do not raise rates, if they leave them unchanged, they abandon their plans to raise rates because of the banking crisis, they're sending a, mess, a message of panic. And I don't think that's a message they want to convey. Um, I think they'll follow the European Central Bank by saying, sure, we have regulators taking care of banks. This is not a big deal. They'll do it behind the scenes. They'll do it on weekends. Don't worry about that. Uh, in the meantime, we still have to fight inflation. The economy is strong. We continue raising rates. We're doing it at small increments, 25 basis points, not taking any risks, but uh, moving, uh, what was it, uh, strong and steady and stable. I don't remember one of those politicians' uh, slogans. And I think we'll con continue uh, doing that. That should give the US dollar a small boost. Uh, tomorrow, we also get the Fed's uh, dot plot. Uh, dot plot is a fancy, well, it's a fun name for the survey of economic projections or whatever they call it. Anyway, they are going to send a message there about the how rates will uh, evolve until the end of the year. I think they'll keep their message of keeping, I mean, raising rates to higher levels this year, above five percent, and uh, forecast cuts uh, next year. So we might see small tweaks. But markets now expect uh, rate, uh, rates to fall, um, the Fed to cut interest rates uh, by in a, with by one percent within a year. That's a lot. Uh, that's because of all the panic around banks. So I expect uh, I expect um, the the Fed to still say we're gonna be data dependent, act as needed. Um, but uh, so far, so good. Inflation is too high, unbearable for American families. Employment is strong. We can raise rates. And if needed, we can change our mind, but we don't see a need for that right now. Okay, I talked a lot about the Fed. Uh, oh, well, the question is about the Fed. So I just spoke about that. Well, I'll speak about what I expect from uh, markets. Uh, I expect just we're currently seeing a 50-50 uh, chance of the Fed raising rates or leaving them unchanged. So just by raising rates, I think the US dollar will get a boost uh, in the short term, but then Powell will speak and he, he will say, he also provides some soothing words about the US economy, about about banks, that uh, American uh, depositors need to be guaranteed and things like that. So I think markets will uh, understand from that what they will want to understand. Not exactly what the Fed says, but the Fed will be re ready to uh, stop its rate hike process, provide more liquidity to markets, perhaps undo the current process of quantitative tightening in which it withdraws money from markets. And in that case, we could see um, we could see uh, first markets falling and the dollar rising on the decision to raise rates, and then a full reversal of that on the Fed's. Um, and Powell's uh, message, uh, which is something typical to Fed decisions. And yeah, you, if you're a member of Premium, you can uh, join our live coverage and ask us questions before, during, and after the Fed uh, event. Okay, yeah, hopefully asked you, answered your, your question. And yeah, we have a few more minutes for more questions. You're welcome to ask me anything about everything I've presented to you about China, about the US, about currencies. Um, I know one popular topic is gold. I didn't mention it here. So um, yeah, gold uh, surpassed the 2000 level today and taking advantage of the panic that was in the morning. So this morning, uh, 
We had Credit Suisse shares, UBS shares, Flange, worries about U.S. regional banks, everything terrible, uh, still no, not out of the woods. And here we go. Uh, I mean, uh, we had a rush to U.S. Uh, bonds that meant uh, lower U.S. yields. When uh, yields fall, gold, which has no yield, rises. And we saw it jump up above 2,000 and then retreat. I see support at uh, 1968 was the recent support level. And then uh, 1959, uh, resistance is at, I don't have a chart here, to, uh, but uh, resistance is uh, at uh, 1998. And then the really big level is to 2026. In any case, uh, gold is trending higher. I expect it with the Fed to suffer sort of a spike down when the Fed raises rates. Again, I expect the Fed to raise rates. It's not a done deal. And uh, um, in case the Fed doesn't raise rates, I expect gold to rise. In case the Fed raises rates, I expect it to fall, but then uh, recover it could serve as a buying opportunity. Um, yeah, so I talked about gold without being asked. I know that it's a popular topic. Uh, and I, well, I know that because uh, many of you in our premium section uh, ask us about it. Uh, let me share my link once again. Maybe I should do a webinar only about gold. You know, it's such a popular topic. Um, yeah, this is my ranking of currencies. Again, not trading advice. And if you have additional questions, you're welcome to ask. I think that's one of the advantages we have that you can uh, ask whatever you want. Here we go. Can you explain Japanese uh, yen risk aversion flow? Yes, of course. So Japanese yen uh, used to be a traditional, still is a traditional safe haven. Or it's not, we, we can look at it as a safe haven or a re, uh, repatriation. So for around 20 years or more, uh, interest rates were low in Japan. Back in 2007, 8, just before the crisis, uh, we had rates of above 5% in the US, above 8% in New Zealand, around 4 or 5% here in Europe. It was a long time ago, but um, you can check it out. And in Japan, they rose to half a percent, okay? So what happened traditionally and still happens today, and the interest rate in Japan is minus 0 0.1. So uh, Japanese investors and others lend money in Japanese yen because it's very, very cheap, and look for attractive investments outside Japan uh, to take risks outside Japan. The, uh, Classic carry trade was uh, going for safe uh, money in Australian banks, for example, or in New Zealand. The money was safe, interest rate was high, but then the world collapsed and, and everything. And investors withdrew their money because interest rates were expected to fall in Australia, New Zealand, well, everywhere, and repatriated them, uh, took them back to Japan. The same happens also now, um, not at the same scale. The U.S. dollar became the world's number one safe haven currency. It's a world reserve currency. Uh, but we still, uh, interest rates are very low in Japan. Again, 4.5% in the U.S., 3% in the Eurozone, and, uh, and still negative in Japan. So uh, in times of trouble, money flows to Japan. That's one factor. Another factor that favors Japan and uh, Japanese yen in these times of trouble is the correlation between dollar yen and uh, US yields. So when money uh, flows to US yields, sorry, to US bonds lowering their yield, uh, dollar yen falls. It has a very strong correlation, US 10 year yields and uh, dollar yen. So when we see dollar yen falling, it also has an indirect impact, collateral damage, if you wish, of strengthening the Japanese uh, yen against other, other currencies. Okay, so money goes to, uh, in these times of trouble, it goes to uh, the Japanese yen for these two reasons. And once we have some improvement, once the hours pass in this current banking crisis and we have no issues, uh, no new issues in, in First Republic, Zions, or all these new names we're learning every day, or no major European bank is in trouble. I don't want to say names, I don't want to cause any uh, panic, but you can look up uh, news reports from the past uh, and see which banks uh, used to be at least more vulnerable. 
uh, then uh, we can say that, but once nothing happens, uh, the Japanese yen loses its attraction. Why stay in, in Japan with very low yield when you can take risk on stocks or any other currency? Okay, so I hope this um, answers your question, uh, John. Yeah, and thank you earlier too. I didn't mention your name, sorry. Hola, uh, Deepu. Uh, for your your question, so hopefully I didn't say that name too wrong. Um, yeah, any more uh, questions? As always, this webinar will be recorded, uh, is recorded, sorry, and will be available on the FX Street website. You can watch it whenever you want. Of course, my answers about the Fed decision will become irrelevant once the Fed decision uh, comes out, but everything else is, of course, irrelevant. And to continue asking questions beyond this uh, free webinar, again, I'll do my, my marketing pitch. You can just join our premium service and, uh, and see and experience how it is. Again, we get lots of positive feedback. And there's only one way to know if it's for you, uh, to sign up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Toda uh, Ramon. Uh, yeah. So thank you very much. Yeah, uh, yeah. Another question: Can you talk about Aussie-China correlation? Sure. Uh, Australia's main export is uh, metals. Uh, iron ore, copper are the strongest ones, but there are lots of metals in uh, Western Australia and also in Queensland, if I'm not mistaken. And the Australian economy. Um, suffered its first recession from 1990 uh, only in 2020 around the COVID crisis. So the demand from China for construction, for um, manufacturing, uh, boosted the Australian economy for a very long time. And that's why uh, um, that's one link. Another thing is that it's hard to trade the Chinese Yuan. There are capital controls, various restrictions. So uh, Trading the Australian dollar became a proxy to trading the Chinese uh, yuan. Um, and another uh, reason is that uh, China is linked to growth when China uh, stimulates its economy. Uh, the entire world enjoys it. Stocks rise everywhere, and the Australian dollar has a good correlation with, uh, with stocks. So these are, um, but the, the fundamental thing here is economics. It's just that um, Australia depends on uh, Chinese uh, imports of its metals. Not only metals, there's also well, student exchange, also, well, economic ties are very strong. Uh, a few years ago, when Australia was angry at China regarding the origins of COVID, uh, we saw the Australian dollar suffer because uh, uh, China began suddenly discovering some wrongdoing by Australian firms. Um, technical problems, and of course it was all political, and that caused worries about falling uh, Chinese demand for Australian goods. And also last year's, um, uh, also COVID related, but not politically related, Chinese um, slowdown of the economy, it hurt, hurt Australia. And now we're seeing um, the Australian dollar stronger thanks to this correlation. Of course, again, Australian dollar is sensitive to stocks, so uh, stocks are, uh, a convulsing, well, we're convulsing around this banking crisis. Okay, hope that answers your question. And yeah, uh, anyway, that's my slide about Australia. I expect Chinese growth to be a bit weaker than than expected, and and the Australian dollar to suffer, and. Uh, Respond less to U.S. Uh, stocks. Okay, so we just had. Uh, wish you all uh, well. Trade with care. These are genuinely crazy markets. We don't see those weekend headlines coming every weekend usually about uh, what's going on with Credit Suisse or or a central bank intervention or you name it. Uh, so really, trade with care. Um, if you don't want to trade alone, want to trade with other people, with us, with our analysts, and 
with a nice community, you're welcome to join the opinion section. I think I've mentioned it a few times. Uh, so uh, that's it, I guess, for today. I see no more questions. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for attending this uh, webinar. Uh, I hope to see you soon. And um, yeah, looking forward to more action in markets. So that's it for today. Thank you very much and bye-bye.